Hi, I'm Lena Rao. Welcome to our Ask a VC show where we put VCs in the hot seat. Uh, we're joined today by Mike Volpe, partner at Index Ventures. Welcome, Mike. Hi, Lena. Um, I want to go into your bio a little bit. Uh, you lead investments for the firm in enterprise and consumer internet companies. Um, you are on the boards of PATH, Sonos, Lookout, Hortonwork, SoundCloud, Big Switch Network, Sora, Foodily, Store Simple, among many others. Um, you were also a longtime employee of Cisco. Lots of experience, sounds like both in consumer um, and internet, consumer internet and enterprise companies. Um, and you, one thing that I think was really interesting about your bio is that you serve on the boards of some enterprise companies, some consumer companies. And I'm fascinated with the role of a VC on a board. And I realize this, this kind of changes at the different stage. But what is really the role of the VC on the boards, especially some of the ones that you're on right now? Well, the first thing I think to realize is that um, a VC's role changes as the company's needs evolve. So you're not always the same kind of an advisor. And also, the board is just one little representation of what you do to help the company grow. So, you know, going to board meetings, important, you show up. If you're surprised at a board meeting or if you learn something you didn't know, you're probably not doing your job right. You know, you really should be much more closely knit with, uh, with the company than just the board meetings. But um, the biggest thing is um, early companies, uh, a lot of it is forming the architecture, the, the skeletal structure, if you will, of the company and of the strategy of the business. And so what you're really helping is building the team, the DNA of the team, recruiting, what is the culture of the team, what are they going after, um, and then what is the big picture strategy? What markets are you going after? What strategies are you pursuing? Uh, what is your differentiation versus the thousands of other companies that are sort of going after the same thing? And I think that's really where things shine. Then, um, then the, there's a big, fairly big separation between enterprise companies and consumer companies because enterprise companies tend to take a fair bit of time then to build their product, um, especially if you're talking about, say, pure storage where I'm on the board. This is a very complex technical product. It took them two years plus to get the product. So there, you're sort of chipping in on kind of product market fit type issues. Uh, but really they're building, building, uh, busy building a product, whereas consumer companies are in the market early and they have to adapt and change and be nimble and put out new releases and so forth. So there's a slight difference in how the two evolve and how you're helping. Then by the time the company started growing up, they have 25, 30, 40, 50 employees. Then there are a wide range of sort of key issues that happen. Some are strategy issues. You're always doing recruiting. Um, certainly you have interesting biz dev type engagements, situations that happen with partners, suppliers, customers, whatever, that kind of change the landscape, the direction of the company. So there's a pivotal moments that you have to be a key advisor on. All through the process, though, if you're, you know, we like to say that if you're doing the job right, you're the first phone call that the CEO makes. That's really kind of your role. But the subject matter of that phone call changes as the company's evolution occurs. So if you had to give advice to startup founders um, or entrepreneurs when choosing a board member, what would you say? You know, what would your advice be? Well, I mean, there's, I think there's two parts of it that are really important. One is I think it's really important that you have board members who get the company and its mission and who get you, right? You as a person. You have to be able to have a very open and transparent engagement for good and bad matters. If you're in a mode of like, oh, I don't want to give the board bad news, then you've got the wrong board member. Right. So it's really about transparency, and they have to understand who you are, how you click, your strengths and weaknesses as a CEO, and how they can help. So that's very important. The other piece is to look at every venture capitalist has a, a series of domain expertise. They might be experts in a functional role. They might know a lot about business development or product development or marketing or sales or something like that. Or they might have a, a industrial domain expertise. They may know something about big data, or they might know, uh, you know, viral applications and consumer internet, or they might know music or something like that. And what you want to do is pick as many of those both functional and uh, uh, sort of industrial domains and say, I need those sets of skills for my company to be successful. And so long as that first condition exists, where we we really get each other as people and as professionals. Then we overlay on top of that the domain expertise, and to the extent that you have that fit, then you've got a good, good connection, um, a good setup with, with your venture capitalist. 
Um, you mentioned big data, and I want to switch over to one of our audience questions, which uh, brings up that concept. Um, the question is, big data has quickly gone mainstream as a buzzword, along with much speculation about how it will push the next generation of tech innovations. What are your thoughts from a VC perspective? Is it too much yeah. you know, of a buzzword now? No, I mean, obviously, like all good buzzwords, it's being applied to everything, right. which is fine. It's sort of normal. But I would say um, it's an enormously important space. And like so often happens in, in tech and in the valley and so forth, people in the industry want to get to the end game at, after five minutes that this thing becomes a hot theme. And, and the end game for big data, generally speaking, is what I'd call sort of business insight or transactional volume. In, in other words, the ab ability to say, I have all this information. And with that, um, I'm going to figure out what my business strategy should be. Or with that, I'm going to be more effective at doing this and this and that transaction. Right. So everybody right now is jumping to the end game of business insight analytics, business intelligence, transactional stuff that's based on big data and so forth. The truth is, the reality of big data, while it's enormously important, is actually way earlier than that. So I serve on the board at Hortonworks, for example, which is one of the largest uh, Hadoop distributions, right? If you actually look at what's happening on the ground in big data, it, it's, a, it's really at first or second base. And first base is just let's collect that data, right? Now, you have some brilliant companies out there like you know Facebook, Twitter, eBay, et cetera, who have been collecting that data because it was obvious to them. The rest of the world? they've been throwing that data on the floor. Like most of the world doesn't even collect their big data. So phase one is let's collect it, let's put it in a repository where we can get at it, where it's cheap and scalable. Um, and that's mostly what people are doing with big data today. That's where the world is. The second step of that is, okay, now that we've collected all that information, let's sort of just moderately organize it. Let's know what's in there, let's know where the data is contained so we can eventually get at it. And I think we're sort of starting in that phase of sort of organization and structure. And then at some point in the future, we're going to get to those business insights and those um, sort of key transactional elements around big data. But timing is everything. And that, to me, is still a ways out. It's not like right this minute. So at least in our in, in the index investment strategy, we've been focused on sort of the f kind of the first two phases, which is the, the collection and organizational bits of, of, of big data. And I think that we'll get to the ultimate goal, but this is a you know, I think big data is sort of a five to ten year trend. Right? It's literally enormous amounts of information which we've been just, broadly speaking, just throwing away. And we're going to start collecting and organizing them. But it's a big, complicated process. I mean, these days, it's hard for companies just to even stand up Hadoop cluster, literally. Yeah. It's, and so we're at that stage right now on the ground. And then we'll get to the good stuff in three to five years. But we got to have that journey. And if you're starting a company, it's important to realize that if you try to get to the end game too soon, um, you actually lose out because the, the real dollars are much earlier in that pipeline. Well, um, I want to switch to one of my favorite topics, which is sort of the inside baseball of the VC world. Um, the next audience question is about the current state of the venture world, where some VCs are hitting home runs and then there's everyone else. I think it's obvious, considering some of the list of, of startups you guys are um, involved in, that you're probably you're hitting the home runs, but. Um, I guess the question is, if this is the state of VC, and if, feel free to argue that it's not, why would startups work with anyone else besides Index and, and some of the other ones that are hitting home runs? Well, I think I would go back to the first thing that we talked mm -hmm. about, which is this notion of what is the right fit between an entrepreneur and a venture capitalist. And while you know we're very fortunate to be investors in some fantastic companies, I don't think that venture capital is a world that it's going to end up being you know, 10 firms. There's going to be uh, a, lot of, a lot of good firms out there and a lot of good investors, some of them who do really well but you don't hear about because they keep a prof much lower profile. And I tend to think that um, success stories derive from companies that do things that are actually pretty different than what people have done in the past. Like when Google came out, not a lot of people were doing exactly what Google was doing. I mean, one or two were, of course. But you know, when Facebook came out, there were one or two social networking companies, but none had broken out the way that. So these big home runs, they come from different fields. And oftentimes, it ends up being uh, investors that were not the obvious one that did some of those. right? So XL is a firm, fantastic firm, huge respect for them. Pre-Facebook, they weren't killing it that much. But post, you know, Facebook ch changed the destiny of that firm. And that's 
sometimes what happens in our industry. And so as an entrepreneur, I think I would go back and say, yes, it's important to work with firms that have a great brand because that's certainly one of the values that a firm delivers. But it's not the only firm. And it's also really important to dig in and figure out who the individual is in that firm that you're going to be working with and what the fit is, the fit as we talked about earlier, with that particular individual. So much as we, you know, the world loves to simplify things by throwing brands out, right? It's Dropbox and Index. It's this and that, right? The truth is a fit between a great company and a great entrepreneur and a venture capitalist is in the fine details. And so I'd encourage a lot of entrepreneurs to, yes, look at the big firms. Yes, look at the brands because those things help. They help you get a press release out when you do a financing event. But ultimately, when you're in that moment where you know, you're trying to make a decision whether you should do this deal with you know, some big telco or not, or whether you should you know, open source this particular piece of software, uh, are you going to have the right person on the phone call or in the meeting to give you the right kind of advice? And that doesn't always come from the brand of the firm, but it comes from the uh, capabilities of the individual and the relationship that you've developed with that venture capitalist over the last year, number of years that you've worked with them. Well, that's great advice to end on. Thank you so much, Mike, for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me.